How you doing? What's going on? Let's bring the energy up in here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So while y'all standing, before y'all sit down, because this is labor and we on our feet, we're on our feet a lot. So before we get started, I want you guys to look to your left and look to your right and say, I got your back. I got your back. I got your back. I got your back. That's right. Now y'all can have a seat. I want to make sure that energy is there and we feel it. So thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody who not only worked on this event and brought me to Canada for the first time. So thank you. It's been, as some may know, yes, my journey started three years ago in 2020 when I let a walk out over COVID-19 uh, because New York City at the time was the epic center of the world. People were dying every 15 minutes. Um, my warehouse, JFK at the time, was employing over 5,000 people from all over New York and New Jersey and Connecticut. And at that time, as a supervisor, uh, for four and a half years, opening up three buildings for Amazon, I felt it was my responsibility to speak up. I spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week with these people in my extended family. There was no way I was going to sit home or be complacent about the fact that Amazon told me not to tell entry-level workers that people were coming to work positive. So when I found out that information in the manager's meeting, I made a decision. That was my last day to work for Amazon. I decided that I was going to leave and organize workers. So I spent the next five days along with my brother, Derek Palmer, who is now the current vice president of the Amazon Labor Union. At the time, I was a supervisor. And we, made a, we both made a decision to organize the workers in the warehouse, not to form a union. We had no intentions on that, to be honest. And I want, I want people to understand that. I wasn't organizing the union in 2020. I wasn't a union organizer uh, prior. Honestly, I had no idea about unionizing. And we can get into that once we have this later discussion. But as far as what we were advocating for at the time was just life or death. We took that opportunity to stand up, speak up. We led a, a rally on March 30th of 2020. Two hours later, I was fired. Over the phone, uh, never been done before, but over the phone they fired me. A week later, Jeff Bezos, who was making 13 billion a day, nine million an hour, almost 5,000 a second. Almost 5,000 a second. They decided to have a smear campaign on me, somebody making less than 50,000. And in the smear campaign that Jeff Bezos at the time signed off on, they called me not smart or articulate, but ironically they said to make me the face of the whole unionizing efforts against Amazon. So I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> so I spent a year, I spent a year after founding my organization, the Congress of Essential Workers, uh, traveling to every Jeff Bezos mansion I could find. From New York to Beverly Hills, starting at his now $140 million penthouse because he keeps buying floors. I guess he needs uh, more bathrooms than the 26 that he already has. I mean, I don't know how many shits you can take a day, but, uh, you know, 26 bathrooms in this $140 million penthouse. Then we went out west to his $165 million penthouse, or I'm sorry, mansion. Then we went to Seattle. Uh, I'm probably forgetting one, but no, there's one more in D.C., $28 million museum that he owns and lives in as well. We went to all these residents. I also did, yes, I did set up, set up a guillotine. I did do that. Um, we, we did all of that for about a year. And while we were doing that, Alabama was starting their efforts. And that building, the demographics there, 85% black and brown workers, 80% black women that worked there. And Amazon spent about $20 million to stop that campaign. 
we drove down there from New York, 16 hours, and me and my brother and a few other Amazon workers to see what was going on. And what we learned, not only was you know, Amazon spending an amount of money to stop the union, but the workers uh, obviously were disconnected from the information. We took that opportunity to say, you know what, uh, there's a learning curve here. With the establishment of the unions, we need a relationship that is worker-led. So we decided to go back home to Staten Island and start the Amazon Labor Union on April of 2021. So, and I'm gonna keep this short because I know we got the next panel coming up, but I spent over 300 days at a bus stop um, talking to workers every day, earning the trust, building the relationship, understanding that my presence was important on the ground. That is something that Amazon cannot calculate. Amazon's ran on numbers, metrics, robots, machines. We're a part of the machine when we work there. But one thing, when you ask about how we defeated a trillion dollar company that put my colleagues in over 3,365 captive audiences and spent over $4.5 million along with getting me arrested, along with you know, union busting every single day, 24 seven for 11 months. How did we defeat this company? One thing they can't calculate is love and solidarity and taking care of one another. So I'm glad that I hear about organizers coming here because now we start to take this fight international and build that international solidarity. So I'm here to help you guys organize these buildings. And we are just starting. This is just the beginning. This is a revolution, and the revolution start with ourselves. Have these conversations at home with your loved ones, your family, your neighbors. Make sure that y'all know that this fight is everybody's fight. It's bigger than us. It's for society. We want to grow up where our children are not subjected to speaking up about health and safety and getting fired. So I'm, thank you again for having me, and I promise you, I promise you, when we fight back, we win. So repeat after me. When we fight back, we win. 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 And if we don't get it, we're going to shut it down. And if we don't get it, 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 every damn time. Power to the people, y'all. Please welcome to the stage someone who needs no introduction, the leader of Canada's NDP, Jagmeet Singh. Wow, that was a speech, my brother. That was awesome. Uh, you can tell you've got a very receptive audience. You fired them up. I got fired up in the backstage. I forgot my mic for a second. I don't know what was going on. I forgot my questions. Um, this is an incredible opportunity. We had a chance to talk. People are really motivated and inspired by your story. And you shared a bit of it, but can you, can you paint a picture for us of what it was like when, first of all, a little bit of your journey, like you, you were someone out of high school, you were thinking music was a path for you, then uh, sports was also something that you were really into, and then brought you to a point where you had to get to work. Tell us a little bit about that, and then I want you to paint the picture for what things were like in the, in the warehouse, what it was like when you started noticing things were, things were not good. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, uh, I realized that I've been an organizer my whole life. Okay. <laughs> just didn't know. Um, That's right. I, I was always different growing up. Uh, my mom would tell you I was raised by a single black mother. 
my father's been incarcerated my entire life. He's still incarcerated. Uh, so watching my mom get up, go to work, uh, go to school, um, me being the oldest in the household, I had to grow up a little bit faster, uh, being the man in the house at a younger age. And uh, that played a part of, of course, developing who I am as a person. And um, I always was a people's person. I always liked to make friends. And when I got into sports, of course, being the team player, being a team captain, being a leader on a team, um, that also helped develop my leadership skills. And when it became uh, time for me to make a decision on what I want to be in life, I, I, music has been a big part of that. Um, I love music. I wanted to be a, a rapper, of course. And uh, I had the, the aspiration as a kid. And yeah, I mean, unfortunately, if you'd have told me I could be as cool as a rapper, as a union organizer, I probably would have been doing it <laughs> a long time ago. But um, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't have no idea because they don't teach us the real labor history in school. So uh, being an a independent rapper, you are an organizer. I had to organize my own shows. I had to do this every week just to get by. Right. And I had to be a people's person. I had to talk to people. I had to hand out flyers. This was before... Instagram, before <laughs> social media, back in the day, you know, we had word of mouth. That's right. And I was out at college campuses promoting my music, promoting my shows. So I was an organizer. Yeah. I just didn't know. I was just on a different team. And, um, uh, yeah, I'd done that for a few years, and, of course, life hit me. Yeah. Um, I, I got married at a young age, uh, had children, and and I had to make a – decision is either take care of my family, be a rapper and lose my whole family. So yeah. uh, I, I decided that I wanted to do music and um, I pursued that for a few years. And once again, life hit me again. Um, being an independent artist is a struggle by itself. And I wasn't making enough money. So I, I had to become what I now know an essential worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I jumped back into the work field and odds and then jobs, and I ended up at uh, two unionized jobs, actually. This is ironic. Uh, I was a teamster for a grocery distribution warehouse for three years, and I also was Unite Here at MetLife Stadium, uh, Giants NFL football stadium for five years wow. before I left to go to Amazon. Okay. So, okay, and then you, you're in Amazon, you're yeah. working in the warehouse, you mentioned in your speech, you talked about the walkout. What were the conditions like? Like, let folks know who've never worked in the Amazon warehouse, what it was like in the warehouse, what the conditions were like, and what you saw, and what kind of led you to be like, this is, this is, there's something wrong here. Right, before, you know, pre-COVID, I was already tapped out with Amazon. I've been there since 2015. Uh, once again, I opened up three buildings, and uh, I applied to be a manager over 50 times. Hmm. in five years, and I was only interviewed twice. So sy systemically, uh, there was a lot of racism to deal with with Amazon. The working conditions, I used to tell my new hires, if you got a gym membership, cancel it. These buildings are massive. They're over a million square feet. They're the size of 14 NFL football fields. You're on your feet for 10 to 12 hours. You're doing calisthenics all day. Um, so, yeah, if you have a gym membership or you have a Fitbit, you might clock in about 20,000, 30,000 miles a day walking uh, the state of Rhode Island. Um, and that's just me as a supervisor. And that doesn't com uh, include your commute. That could be two and a half hours, three hours each way. Hmm. Um, so working 10 to 12 hours and then commuting two and three, three hours each way, um, you have no family time. Hmm. You have no no real uh, vacation time. You just work. You rinse and repeat. And that's the life of an Amazon worker. Right. You work so much. And let me tell you now, they're not coming home to watch Democracy Now. They're not coming home <laughs> and watching CNN or watching whatever media. Uh, we just come home and we prepare ourselves mentally and physically for the next day mm. just to get through. So that was my life for... Uh, you know, five years with Amazon. And, um, you know, just to give you a more insight of how the buildings are 
um, yeah, the injury rate in Amazon is is probably the leading industry. Uh, well, the most in the, in the industry actually in mm -hmm. the country. There's injuries every single day at one of these warehouses that people just do not see or hear about. Wow. And I can tell you during our campaign, um, we probably seen ambulances pull up to these warehouses um, sometimes three or four times in one day. Wow, wow. So you're, you're, you're seeing the systemic discrimination, you're trying to apply for a, a supervisor position, you're not getting it, you see your workers, your coworkers being disrespected, you see these horrible work conditions, and at some point you're like, I gotta do something about it. W what was the trigger? What, what was that moment where you're like, this can't continue. I, got, I gotta step up and do something. It was definitely the pandemic. Um, you know, sitting here now, you know, people ask me all the time, did you ever see yourself uh, sitting in this position as the president of a union? And I'm like, of course not. We Three. just take that in, president of the ALU right beside me. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I'm like, I want to... I want to be fully honest with everybody. Three years ago, I was on my way to a Pop Smoke concert, rest in peace. Yeah, that's right. You know, and I wasn't, me and the vice president of the union, you know, we weren't, we weren't thinking about organizing. We were living our lives, taking care of our family, uh, going to work. Right. And uh, I was going through the worst time of my life. I was going through a divorce. Uh, I was struggling to make ends meet, and then the pandemic hit me. Mm. So it was a life or death situation for me. I lost everything in one day. When I got fired on March 30th, um, I was not only the, one of the highest paid supervisors in Amazon, uh, the most tenured at that position at Amazon. Um, I had my health benefits, I had my 401k, I had a couple of shares that I had to pay into, but I had a couple. And I lost all of that. I had to use all of that in you know, my resources to survive the pandemic. Even while organizing, uh, I had no income and uh, my life changed forever. Mm. So for me, it was a no brainer when it came to life or death as a supervisor, when, man when management told me not to tell the workers that I spend 60 hours a week with that somebody who's in the building positive, um, I couldn't stand with that. Right. You know, that's inhumane. Okay, wow, wow. So you, you see the plight of your, your workers around you, you stand up and you start organizing, you start fighting back, and then what happened, which you probably didn't expect, but then you got targeted. You got a lot of heat on you when you were trying to raise awareness and, and be a, a champion for workers, you ended up getting scapegoated, getting attacked, and tell us a little bit about what that's like, because I think some of the things that we don't, you know, we, we know the, the adulation, the folks in this room are really inspired by you, but it's important to also hear a bit of the struggles when you're trying to do this important work, it's tough, and you had a lot of weight on you, and you were, you were the target. Tell us what that was like. Yeah, so when it comes to union busting, Amazon, well, just in general, their goal is to divide the workers and create a bunch of uh, misinformation, mm -hmm. demonizing the organizers. So their goal was to focus on me and make it seem like I was intimidating. Um, they called me uh, a thug. They called me a gangbanger. They, you know, they spread a lot of racism with the union busters. Actually, they actually flew the union busters from Alabama, who were all. Uh, right-wing conservative um, Trump supporters, the union busters, that they were paying $10,000 a day. They flew them to Staten Island, the same group. Um, the first week in there, he didn't realize where he was at. He's in New York. The same. <laughs> so the first week in New York, this guy's walking around to a certain demographic of people in the warehouse, and he's saying all this racist stuff about me. They're nothing but a bunch of thugs. They're nothing but Black Lives Matter protesters. Oh, we kicked their asses in Alabama. They're gonna go away. You're just gonna make Chris Smalls rich. 
you know, he wants a Lamborghini. He didn't realize I'm a BMW guy, you know. So <laughs> he was just saying all this dumb shit. And uh, what happened was he didn't realize he was talking to one of my lead organizers. Really? <laughs> I'm like, once again, this is not Alabama, man. Um, you know, so on top of that, uh, the racism and the fact that they tried to divide workers and demonize the organizers, they had me arrested a few times right. uh, for serving food. So when you're giving food to people for almost 10 months, I spent over 300 days at a bus stop across the street from the building uh, providing food, uh, providing resources, paying people's bills, paying people's Ubers to the hospital. Uh, I've done all these things during the campaign. And then when you arrest me, uh, that kind of backfired because, you know, Amazon didn't realize how, one thing Amazon doesn't know is their workers. Right. I know them. Okay. You know, I, I have that relationship with right. them. And they couldn't figure out why people were gravitating towards us. And once again, as I explained, the love and solidarity and caring for one another, that's free. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need trillions of dollars. We don't need millions of dollars. We don't need captive audiences. Those five minutes from the time they got off the bus to the time they walked to the building to clock in, those conversations are so valuable. Mm. Because when you're an organizer, it's not always about uh, you know, being there. It, well, it actually, it is about being there. It's it's about being there where the workers are ready. Mm -hmm. It's a long fight. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. If you're not there, when that worker is ready to talk to you, you already lost the battle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, my presence and being there as a supervisor, a few that spoke up during the whole pandemic and the journey, um, that was very important. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I would never forget those moments, you know, those conversations I had with workers to really convince them that I'm here, even though they terminated me, but I'm here for you guys. You know, that, that picture right there resonated. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, so this journey, in addition to the pressures that you felt and the being targeted, it's also been an up and down journey. You had some great success, but there's also been some setbacks. Uh, the loss in Albany was, was a tough loss. And with the ups and downs, what kind of keeps you going? What, what keeps you going despite all the pressures, being targeted, and sometimes the ups and downs of the journey? What keeps you, what keeps you going? Well, I mean, I look at organizing differently than... Some people, you know, uh, I don't count wins and losses because for me, I'm like, it's only a loss if you give up. Ah, you know? that's right. Yeah. And Albany, even though they weren't successful, there's a lot of intangibles when it comes to organizing the uh, union. You know, I don't recommend going the independent route, but uh, <laughs> we, we chose that way because it's necessary. Amazon's been around for 29 years. For 29 years, established unions had their opportunities. So we needed something different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what we've done with our organizing is unprecedented. You know, we're dealing with a, a trillion dollar monster, one of the most powerful companies in modern day history. Um, we had to adapt to the 21st style of organizing, new school of organizing. And we're gonna take risk and shots that we never took before. Mm -hmm. I don't look at them as losses because we put workers in a position to make a decision for themselves. Right. So how could you say that we lost when we're talking about we're just workers? We're not, we're the group of individuals that came together to try to unionize. Mm -hmm. Now, Amazon is the one that illegally union busted. Mm -hmm. Captive audiences are illegal. Uh, uh, coercing workers are illegal. But they break the law because they know these things take two or three years to resolve. They do it on purpose. They fire people, they retire, retaliate. So the loss is not really a loss because the workers really didn't have much of a voice. You know, Amazon gives them the, the, the talking points. They give them the, the vote no cards, the, the vote no propaganda all day, every day. We as workers only have so much that we can control. And actually the, the, the fact that we took that shot 
it opened up an avenue for the legal process to take place mm -hmm. to the point where actually that building that lost is ahead of JFK because mm -hmm. that same region gave Starbucks workers who are organizing a bargaining order because that NLRB realizes that there's a lot of illegal practices going on with these right. companies. So what do you think they're going to do for us? All right. <laughs> I mean, if they give them a bargaining order, it's only right that hopefully, uh, and that's exactly what we're working on, is that Amazon hopefully will be held accountable. Mm -hmm. The election results will be reversed like they did in Alabama. And actually, we're trying to go, we have a progressive, a really good progressive general counsel, Jennifer Abruzzo, who I've been in several conversations with. We're trying to get a bargaining order in Albany where they lost, mm. even Beautiful. before JFK. So this is, it's not a loss for us because once again, it's only a loss if you give up. That's it. That's it. That's awesome. So I feel like we're getting close to time, but I want to get into what advice you would give. Like there's lots of folks in this room that are organizers themselves. There's folks that work in unions. We got Starbucks in, in Canada where there's been some breakthroughs where young folks came together and organized for the first time. It's given some inspiration here in Canada as well. What would you say to, to workers here? We want to see you in, I mean, we talked about this. We want to see you in, in warehouses and Amazon getting people organized here in Canada. What would you say to those workers? What would you say to people that are, are nervous maybe about getting into this, are thinking like we're, we're small and these companies are so huge and they're so powerful. What would you say to workers that, that want to start organizing? What advice would you give them? The time is now. Hey. There's no time, hey. no point in, point in return. We already seen our, our value, our worth during the pandemic. Uh, we are underpaid, we are underappreciated, and the time is now. Um, I do not want to grow up, well, have my children grow up in a society where they can be subjected to retaliation. Um, and we have to realize our victory, you know, we have really short attention span, especially in America. So uh, even though we, we made history last year, th this is really just the beginning. Um, we kicked down the door, now it's time to let everybody in. And that means everybody, no matter what industry you work in, whether it's Starbucks, whether it's Amazon, Trader Joe's, Apple, Google, Walmart, Whole Foods, Target, it doesn't matter. You're a worker at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what movement you're a part of, from Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, you know, whatever. Whatever you're a part of, at the end of the day, you're a worker. So for my advice is don't quit your job, organize. That is, that's what you have to do, because when you quit and they say, oh, well, you know, just find another job, you're only jumping from one fire into the next. So why not? organize your workplace so that even if you're leaving the job, you providing a better protection for that next person. Mm. And, and that's how we change the system. That's how we make a society where it's, it's sustainable. We are living check to check. We're getting breadcrumbs. We're not getting the wages that we deserve, the health benefits that we deserve. And there's no cavalry coming for us, especially in America. We don't have a labor party. We have two parties of the same. And if some of y'all have been watching my journey, y'all saw what I told Lindsey Graham. It's not a left thing, it's not a right thing. This is a workers thing. Meaning that it don't matter. The workers are the ones that make the revenue for the, com the company. Jeff Bezos is not coming down to pack any box. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you that right now. So who really is, who really is the rich people? Yeah. Who really is? the billionaires, it's really us. You know, we have to understand, these billionaires wanna to fly to space and have, you know, and their, and their penis rockets. <laughs> they can do that all they want, but when they come down, they gotta meet labor, and that's what we have, we have to understand. We have to build that right yeah. now. Yeah. That's beautifully put. We, we talked about this a bit, you know, you have this very, um, very powerful unifying vision around how we speak to workers. We're talking about, you know, workers might have different, they might think that they're different political ideologies, they might have different political persuasions or beliefs, 
But ultimately, you, we talked about this. What is, what is the way you found to get people to get behind the movement? And we mentioned in Staten Island, where you first did the organizing, that's the, the only borough in all of New York that actually went red. You had a lot of Trump supporters there, people you wouldn't think that would be open to union organizing. So what was your philosophy around how do you speak to a worker and, and have them come together? We were talking a bit about this idea that you know, there's something that you can unify people. Right. Keeping the workers uh, agitated about the boss mm. um, was the main key. You know, once again, yes, like you mentioned, five boroughs in New York, there's only one that's red, and we happen to organize just that one. <laughs> um, and my warehouse has 8,300 plus members. Of course, they're all not gonna be Democrats. And yes, we on Trump Island, Staten Island is Trump Island. You go everywhere, there's Trump flags everywhere. Um, so we had to be careful and stay neutral when it comes to political views and values. But at the same time, um, when you're organizing, it's more about accountability to yourself and availability. The best availability and the best accountability is being available. And it didn't matter. We had workers walk past me for two or three months, wouldn't even take a, a pamphlet, wouldn't even have a conversation with me. But that day when managers got on their ass for, for time off task or written them up, we were there. And that's what it's about. Two or three months, six months, no matter what, understanding this fight is a marathon, understanding that whenever that work is ready and they can come outside of that, that warehouse and see me across the street at that bus stop at a tent, that was powerful by itself. Because they knew this guy don't have to be out there. As much as Amazon was saying all this demonizing things about me, they couldn't believe that because they were like, how can this guy be all of these negative things and this man is outside in the winter time, he's outside in 95 degree temperature, he's outside with a puppy, he's outside giving us <laughs> barbecues every week, you know, free food. How can this guy be a thug or, you know, so playing into that rhetoric that Amazon was playing into was backfiring on him. Right, right. And, and once again, Amazon's ran off of metrics numbers, machinery, robots. They cannot calculate love. Mm. And that's how we defeat not just Amazon, but any company. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. <laughs> when we were talking, you mentioned uh, the, well, the other unifying factor. We talk to a worker, and you make it about their wages and their work conditions. Like that's the unifying factor. Everyone can get behind that. And how's that been? Like when you speak to a worker and say, wherever you're at, you know, it's about I want to improve working conditions and your wages. That's that's what that's the number one thing that we want. You know, uh, job security is up there and wages is right there, right behind it because uh, minimum wage in our country has not changed in decades. And as you can imagine, the inflation and the cost of living just continues to go up. Uh, the co corporations continue to put profits over people. And we're not fighting for $15 anymore. You know, $15, if you think, it, if you break it down, the government gave us $600 checks, 40 hours a week, that's $15 an hour. That's what they gave us during the, pan the pandemic. Uh, we know that that's a breadcrumb. Not when Jeff Bezos is making $13 billion a day. Um, there's no way that he can't take one million of those dollars and pay his workers $30 an hour. Hey, hey, so there you go. We, we are at a time where our wages, our wages need to be increased. These corporations and billionaires, the 1% class, they have the money. Uh, we, we see what they spend it on and uh, we see also how the government is giving them, you know, tax rebates and allowing them not to pay any taxes. So we actually pay more taxes than Jeff Bezos. Does that make yeah. any sense? None at all. None at, None all. at all. So wages, when it comes to wages, and they tell workers all the time, don't discuss wages with your colleagues. They tell you that on purpose. They don't want you to know how much less you're making than management. So while management is making over six figures and have all the shares, 
You're making 30, 40,000, struggling, working two or three jobs. We're saying enough is enough. We're not doing that anymore. One job should be enough, and you need to pay us what we worth. That's right. That's right. And I'll just add to this, you know, yeah. when they say the path to, you know, the middle class, you know, the middle class, well, the path to the middle class is unionizing. Um, hey, hey. That's the only way we can improve our, our quality of life. And, and I realized that from being on both sides. You know, I was a union member before I actually worked at Amazon. I left the union thinking Amazon was uh, a quality of life and opportunities. I realized I was wrong. I had a, un had a honeymoon phase. Um, and that's, that's for everybody. You know, everybody that gets hired at Amazon, they go through this honeymoon phase where, oh my God, I got hired by Amazon. It's a good company because of the propaganda they put out there. Uh, and we have to go through these things until things affect us. And that's when we realize like, wow, things are really not what it seemed. And we can't be at, we can't blame workers for that. You know, there's no worker that's wrong. They're just misinformed. And, and that's what I realized, you know, I can't be mad because this worker is not as radical as I am now, because that was me three years ago. You know, I was the same, I was the same person just walking into the warehouse, clocking in, trying to provide, get my check and go home and rinse and repeat. So it took them firing me to realize that, oh, they done messed with the wrong person this time. <laughs> and, and now I'm gonna take the fight to them. And, and that's a part of organizing, is realizing that organizers, um, you know, we, we have a very stressful life now. And you're gonna have days of doubt. You're gonna have days of defeat. You're gonna have days when nobody talks to you. You're gonna have days where people don't sign the union card. But you're gonna have days where 200 people may talk to you. Days where, uh, you know, you sign up a thousand people. That's right. You're gonna have those days. But if you're not there, and you're not, once again, being available for that worker, you miss that opportunity. And that's what I learned as well. Being there, being available is the best accountability and the best way to organize it because you're meeting the where they at, which is at work. That's amazing, that's amazing. So, you kind of answered this question, but I, I kind of wanted you to maybe to lean into it a bit more. Like, no one would have thought that barbecues and, you know, handing out some food to folks and having a nice time chatting with them would be how you and the, and the team took on one of the most powerful, wealthiest, richest corporations in the world. So what does it take for the worker to take on these, I mean, if you look at the, the analogy of like a David taking on a Goliath, like how does a worker that feels like we don't have the power as workers, we don't have the, the resources as workers. How does a worker take on these big fights with companies that got deep pockets, they've got all the resources, the lawyers, the union busters? How, how does a worker take on that? Like how does that imagery of a, of a barbecue and then you got the billionaire Jeff Bezos, like that is a wild comparison, but that's what it was. The barbecues beat the billionaire. Yeah. It, it, it. It's so, it's still surreal to me, you know, when I think about it. But when it comes to um, beating any company and, and really encouraging workers, uh, we built a culture that Amazon just never seen before. And earning the trust and building relationships. I actually use Amazon's principles against them. Amazon has 14 principles, and I know every last one of them. Um, but my favorite one was disagree, have a backbone, and commit. <laughs> they didn't like that one, but I'm like, <laughs> I use it all the time. Um, I disagree with what you're telling me, and the commitment is I'm committing to what I'm doing, and I'm going to see that through. No, that's having to disagree, a backbone, and committing to it. Wow. And I use that principle while organizing, and we still continue to use these principles. There's another principle that Jeff Bezos love. You know, every day is day one. Mm. That's, that's Amazon's favorite one. 
uh, work hard, have fun, make history. <laughs> but really, you work hard, you don't have fun, and when they fire you, yeah, you're history. <laughs> so when we were organizing, we made it fun, we worked hard, and we really made history. So we Woo! said, you know what? We got the value. There you go. Folks, that's our time. Chris Smalls, everybody. That was awesome. What a wrap up right there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, brother. That was good, man. That was good. That was good. That was good.